And good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us for this Advent Health Community Education event. I'm Victoria Dunkel, and Advent Health Hendersonville's orthopedic program is one that leads the way in safety and high quality surgical experiences for patients across the region. Tonight, we are focusing on advanced treatment for shoulder arthritis. And as we get started this evening, I do wanna take a moment and share just a few details with you for tonight's event. We do have an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of this presentation. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A section at the, on the bottom of your screen. You can do that at any time throughout the presentation. And if you want to do so anonymously, there is a button at the bottom before you hit submit that allows you to select the anonymous option. So do that before you hit the submit button. Then when uh, the presentation is done, I will be sharing some of those questions with Dr. Boykin and to get you some answers as this evening proceeds. Speaking of Dr. Boykin, we are so excited to have Dr. Robert Boykin with us this evening. He is an orthopedic surgeon with Emerge Ortho and co-managing physician of the orthopedic surgery program here at Advent Health Hendersonville. Dr. Boykin performs cutting edge surgery for the shoulder, including rotator cuff repair, lateral repair, biceps tendon repair, and shoulder replacement. <clears throat> he completed his residency at Harvard University and then he, then he received extensive subspecialty training in sports medicine, knee, shoulder, and hip arthroscopy at the Stedman Clinic in Vail, Colorado. After that fellowship, or in addition to that, he worked with numerous professional athletes and traveled with the U.S. ski team. After his fellowship, he traveled to France where he completed additional training in advanced shoulder surgery. That was at the Alps Surgery Center. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Boykin. Good evening, Dr. Boykin. Great, Victoria. Thank you for the introduction. I'm gonna pull up my screen here to share my talk. And just, uh, are you able to see my screen here? We can, it's now at the very beginning, great. Very good, well, thanks again. Thank you for sponsoring this event, for having me tonight. I, I'm fortunate to get the chance to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, which is shoulder arthritis. It's something I see and treat frequently in my clinic. And uh, it's something that I've had a keen interest in throughout my training and throughout my practice as well. And so to talk about shoulder arthritis, we need to understand a little bit about the shoulder joint. The shoulder is a ball and socket joint with a ball being called the humeral head and the socket being called the glenoid. And this ball and socket type configuration is different than a joint like the hip because there's not as much bony coverage. And this allows for the greatest range of motion of any joint in the body and relies particularly on soft tissues such as the rotator cuff and other muscles. Uh, some of my hip and knee colleagues may argue that the hip or the knee joint's the best, but, but certainly we think the shoulder joint, uh, to me at least, is the best and most interesting joint of all. When we talk about the muscles which power the shoulder, the ones you hear about the most are the rotator cuff. And this is a group of four main muscles which are deep in the shoulder, which provide power to the shoulder to provide it uh, a flexion moment to cause it to lift, to bring it internally or to bring it externally. And they're essential to provide power to the shoulder. Uh, the more superficial muscles, I just wanna mention one called the deltoid you can see here, which is this large muscle on the outside of your shoulder because this will become important as we talk about different types of shoulder replacements and shoulder function. This is a large muscle which also helps power the shoulder as well, and it works in conjunction with the rotator cuff musculature. When we talk about shoulder arthritis and how do we define arthritis, by true definition, arthritis is painful inflammation of a joint. In this case, it's the glenohumeral joint between the ball and socket of the shoulder. And what we really mean by arthritis is a loss of the articular cartilage. The articular cartilage is this smooth lining on the end of the ball in the socket, which we are born with. It has a very low coefficient of friction and it allows our joints throughout the body to move essentially painlessly until it becomes damaged. Uh, over time, through aging, through wear and tear, through activities or through trauma, this cartilage can get chipped and cracked and, and worn down and eventually it wears out. Once this cartilage is gone, we don't have any way to replace it. This is not a tissue which can heal. And so what we're left with is bone on bone contact between the ball and the socket, which is quite painful. This then leads to progressive inflammation, stiffness and pain, and overall diminished function of the shoulder. 
And so when someone comes in with, with arthritis, what are common symptoms? One is pain with overhead motion and trying to lift the arm. It's quite common that patients will complain of a deep or aching pain at rest, including pain at night, which wakes them up. Loss of range of motion, which we call stiffness, is quite common as the arthritis progresses and the bone on bone progresses. And then weakness, which is mostly secondary to pain. If it's just arthritis and the muscles are okay, the weakness patients have is secondary to pain while moving their arm. It's also quite common to hear a sensation of grinding or catching. And many times in the clinic, you can feel this or hear it out loud. For evaluation, if, we see, if we're seeing you for shoulder pain and working up arthritis, first we take a history of the symptoms you've had, how long they've been going on, where it's hurting you, what's hurting you, and make sure that this pain is not coming from your neck or a pinched nerve or another joint. Uh, next is physical exam where we look at range of motion, test strength, and look at areas of tenderness. And then finally, on any initial evaluation at the orthopedic clinic for shoulder pain, we're gonna take what we call plain radiographs or x-rays of the shoulder. Uh, if we look at x-rays of a normal shoulder, you can see here uh, the humeral head, which is the ball, the socket, which is the glenoid. I can bring my mouse over here. And you see that in between uh, these two, there is quite a bit of space in a normal shoulder. That space represents this articular cartilage or this cushion of the shoulder, which we normally have. If we look at a patient who has arthritis on this x-ray on the right side of the screen, you can see that this is very different. There's no space left that articular cartilage is worn away. And this is what we call a bone-on-bone -bone articulation for advanced arthritis of the shoulder, which can be diagnosed from plain x-rays alone. Moving on to treatment. So we've diagnosed arthritis, the patient's having symptoms. Uh, what do we do next? And we wanna divide this really into four categories. The first is lifestyle modifications or physical therapy and exercise. The second would be medications or supplements the third injection therapy, and then the fourth and final option would be that of surgery. So for lifestyle modifications, this essentially means just do things that are not causing you pain and avoid activities that cause pain. Typically, this is limiting heavy or overhead lifting. We wouldn't recommend uh, things like our, our patient is doing here. And just staying away from things which bother your shoulder. And many patients can modify, especially as we get older, and a shoulder is a non-weight bearing joint. So you can, you can get around without having to use it quite as much and be okay with activity modification. Physical therapy can be useful with early shoulder arthritis. This can improve stiffness and also increase strength in the shoulder, but there's really limited efficacy in patients who have advanced bone on bone arthritis because trying to stretch that out is, is simply not gonna work. And just grinding and pushing on the shoulder more can sometimes lead to more pain uh, than not doing therapy. So that's tailored to each individual situation, whether or not we may recommend that. In terms of medication therapy or supplements, the first line therapy for any type of arthritis is typically the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or what we call the NSAIDs. These are the ibuprofen, Aleve, Naproxen, Meloxicam, Indomethacin, and drugs like that, which are great drugs to reduce inflammation and relieve pain. And they can be quite useful in treating arthritis. The issue is these medications have side effects, which can include bleeding, stomach ulcers, uh, issues with the kidney or the heart. And so it's very important if we're going to use these for arthritis that we use them in the short term, or if you require long-term treatment with these, that we speak to your primary care doctor and really go over the risk of these medications uh, before using them. Uh, Tylenol is another option for arthritis. This is more of a pain reliever and less of an anti-inflammatory this can be helpful as well and is generally well tolerated, but shouldn't be used if you're someone who has liver disease. Uh, narcotic medications, the oxycodone, hydrocodone, things you've seen in the, uh, in the news quite uh, frequently as of late are not typically recommended for treatment of arthritis. These can be addictive and habit forming and are simply uh, painkillers which work in the short term. And we don't recommend these or prescribe these for arthritis type pain. Uh, these are more used right after a surgery for a day or two and that type of pain or in the rare situation that, that someone can't have a procedure and they need these long term, they are best managed by a pain management specialist. And then finally, supplements. There are a number of different supplements uh, which are out there and available, uh, some promoted on news networks and TV channels and ones you can see at CVS or Walgreens. And, and of all those, the one that we go to the most is called glucosamine and, and chondroitin sulfate. And generally, this is a well-tolerated supplement. It's not considered harmful. The issue with some of these supplements is they're not regulated by the FDA. And so it's hard to really know what's in them. 
but many of our patients have found you know, some name brand glucosamine and chondroitins uh, that you see at, at CVS, Walgreens, or, or other places like this to help with arthritis type pain. There are many large clinical trials looking at the efficacy of these drugs, and many of these show very mixed results. Some show improvement in moderate to severe arthritis, some show no difference than placebo. And what I generally tell patients is I don't think these are harmful to try. If they help you, I think they're safe to be on. If they're not helping you, it's probably not worth wasting your money to continue on them. So the third treatment option is injection therapy. And our first line treatment for arthritis in terms of injections is, is a cortisone injection or a corticosteroid injection. Uh, we use the word cortisone to encompass a number of different medications which are of a similar family, which is corticosteroids. And uh, different physicians will have different uh, specific medications they like to use. The one I like to use predominantly in the shoulder is, is called Kenalog. And this is a injection, which is basically a temporizing measure. It's a high strength anti-inflammatory. It's like, I tell people, it's like putting supercharged ibuprofen directly into the joint. And it, it typically works very well if it's put in the right spot. Uh, many of the shoulder injections that you may get will be for bursitis uh, above the shoulder joint, above the rotator cuff. And arthritis really requires putting the medication deep into the joint between the ball and the socket where the conflict is. So this requires skill placement of somebody who has experience doing this. Uh, many people now will use ultrasound guidance uh, if needed to get it into the shoulder joint. And typically there's a maximum of three to four of these injections per year as a temporizing measure. We like to wait a minimum of 90 days to do this. And there are risks to these injections. There's a very low risk of infection uh, with proper cleaning but there can be medication side effects from the steroids. It can make some people feel jittery or hyper. It can keep some people up at night and it can certainly elevate blood sugars and diabetics. So we kind of have to weigh the risk versus the benefit. But in most patients, the benefit of, of trying this outweighs the risk. In terms of other injection therapies, I've categorized these as really experimental. And, and many of you may have heard of visco supplementation, which is hyaluronic acid. And these are the gel shots or rooster comb shots that you hear about quite frequently in the knee. Uh, many of these have been developed over the past 20 years or so to treat knee arthritis. But when they went through the, the FDA and insurance companies for approval, they were only approved for use in the knee joint. And so while we think the mechanism of action would work exactly the same in the shoulder, they never were approved for on-label use in the shoulder. So we can use these types of gel shots in the shoulder I've had some patients who have great success with these visco supplementation shots. Again, it's a temporizing measure, not a curative treatment, but we have to use them off label. And basically that means the insurance won't cover them, which is a major impediment to using these shots, which can be expensive. Uh, you may have heard of platelet-rich plasma, which is a biologic treatment where your blood is, is taken out of a vein, spun down and the platelets and growth factors are centrifuged and concentrated and then injected back into the shoulder. And as of 2020 and 2021, there are a number of studies which demonstrate improvements in arthritis. Again, this is an anti-inflammatory. It's, it's basically reducing inflammation and reducing symptoms and trying to create a better environment to perhaps slow down some of the progression of arthritis, but mostly to treat symptoms. This is not gonna cure your shoulder arthritis. This is not gonna make new cartilage. And it's very minimal risk because it's your own body it's just, again, considered experimental and therefore it's not covered by insurance. And then finally, I just wanted to make a mention of stem cell therapy or mesenchymal stem cells. This is something you see advertised all over the papers and all over the news networks. And you see x-rays where somebody has bone on bone arthritis and then it grows back to create a normal looking x-ray. And, and this has really been studied quite well, but these studies are ongoing. The big problem is there are many different types of stem cells and they've been used in different indications. And so it's hard to compare because we're not comparing apples to apples. And my take on the literature for this is that they may help reduce inflammation in young patients who may be missing a small area of cartilage. I think these could be useful to try and regrow cartilage. But for most patients who have advanced shoulder arthritis where most of the cartilage is lost, I don't see much data which would suggest that these are gonna regrow your shoulder cartilage. This is not the fountain of youth but it's certainly something that could be tried and generally seems to be well tolerated. Uh, a major issue of these is many of these stem cell type therapies can be very expensive as well and are still considered investigational by the FDA. And so what about surgical options? Uh, many people come in with arthritis and ask, hey, am I a candidate to get camera surgery? 
uh, on my arthritic shoulder. And the camera surgery, which we do, is quite frequent. And this is the preferred treatment for patients who come in with rotator cuff tears or labral tears or problems with their biceps tendon who don't have much arthritis. Um, you see a picture of the camera here. And this is a picture from the inside of the shoulder where we can visualize the, the socket and the ball and the biceps tendon and the rotator cuff very well. And in the year 2020, we can repair most soft tissue problems with a camera, uh, which, which used to require an open surgery. These procedures, however, have very limited utility in patients who have advanced arthritis. And the problem here is, is you can go in and clean things out. You can clean out some of the bone spurs or clean up the arthritis, but you're not treating the root of the problem. The root of the problem is you're missing cartilage and the shoulder camera surgery is not gonna give you new cartilage. It may help things feel better for a short amount of time, but we rarely ever recommend this in patients who have advanced arthritis because this is simply a temporizing measure. And if we're gonna try to temporize your arthritis for a little while, we'd rather do it with a shot, which is much less risky than a camera surgery. And then finally, arthroplasty, which is shoulder replacement, which we get to talk about tonight. And what arthroplasty means is the placement of a new ball, which would be a partial shoulder replacement, or a new ball and socket, which is called a total shoulder replacement. And this is the preferred treatment for patients who have shoulder arthritis. It allows us to move the areas of damaged or arthritic worn out joint and replace it with new parts so that there can be a smooth bearing to the joint and that rids the patient of the pain they're getting from the bone on bone articulation. Uh, it, to me, the, the analogy is sort of like a tire. When, when you're born, you have a certain amount of tread on your tires and your shoulder joint. And over time, this tread wears down. Eventually, your tire will be bald, and you can try to patch it and, and change air levels and do all sorts of stuff to keep it going. But at some point, you have to change the tire. And that's what a shoulder replacement is, is basically changing the tire on your shoulder and giving you a new set of tires. And so if we break this down and talk a little bit about the types of shoulder replacements, a hemiarthroplasty is a partial shoulder replacement. That means replacing the ball only typically done in younger patients where most of the arthritis is on one side, on the ball side, not the socket side. An anatomic or a standard total shoulder replacement means replacing the ball and socket just as they are with a new ball and socket made of metal and what's called a highly cross-linked polyethylene plastic. The final shoulder replacement is called a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. And this is a separate procedure, which we will show some pictures of here and run through the differences between each of these. To give you some history, the first shoulder replacement was developed by a French surgeon, Dr. Payan in France, who implanted a platinum and rubber shoulder in 1893. Uh, in 1951, Dr. Neer in the United States came up with the design of what we consider the anatomic shoulder, similar to what we use today. Uh, in the United States. And the early work was taken from hip replacements, which had advanced a little bit ahead of the shoulder. In 1974, the first modern shoulder replacements came about. And so we've really had these type of replacements for almost 50 years of experience in the United States. When we look at the hemiarthroplasty, we talked about the partial replacement. This involves just replacing the ball versus a total shoulder arthroplasty, which is a replacement of both the ball and the socket. When we talk about anatomic shoulder replacement, so this is just a normal shoulder replacement, replacing the ball and the socket, as you see in this x-ray here on the right, the shoulder prosthesis, the implant, relies on the rotator cuff for strength and stability. So this is exactly the same way that your normal shoulder relies on the rotator cuff to have power to move it. We know that typically older patients are ones developing shoulder arthritis, and there's a high prevalence of rotator cuff tears in that age group. And so what was found over time as they put more and more of these anatomic or normal shoulder replacements in patients, that if the patient had a rotator cuff tear at the time of surgery, or if they developed a rotator cuff tear later, then the replacement wouldn't work. And why this was is the primary rotator cuff muscle that comes over the top, it's called the supraspinatus tendon. And that provides power to lift the arm, but it also pushes the ball down and holds it centered on the socket. So there's an equal center of rotation of the shoulder. If there's a rotator cuff tear, such as in this patient, so the rotator cuff is split and torn, what happens to the humeral head is it migrates superiorly. There's no rotator cuff to push this down. 
And so you can see the center of rotation of the, of the ball is moving up while the socket stays the same. This causes a major problem with shoulder replacements because it creates a situation where there's eccentric loading so that the ball is not loading the socket like it should normally, and it's pushing more on the top of the socket. This rocks the socket back and forth in what's called a rocking horse phenomena, and eventually leads to loosening of the socket of the plastic in the socket and failure of the shoulder replacement, uh, as you can see, which is happening to this patient here. And so this was a major problem. So what, what do you do with a patient who comes in who's developing shoulder arthritis but also has a concomitant rotator cuff tear. So the patient who does not have a functioning rotator cuff but has arthritis, we know the treatment for arthritis is shoulder replacement, yet we also know if we put a regular shoulder replacement in, it's not gonna work because the rotator cuff's not gonna keep it down. So this patient shows up with an x-ray here. You can see that the ball is high riding compared to the socket. The center of rotation is too high. In fact, this ball is so high that it's hitting the shoulder blade. And, and this tells us just based on x-ray alone that this rotator cuff is not functioning and there's essentially no rotator cuff there. In the United States prior to about 2004, this was really kind of the end of the road for these patients. The treatment was, you just kind of have to live with this. We can do injections and we'll do the best we can, but we really don't have an option for you because the shoulder replacements we have are not going to work. And so thanks to another French surgeon named Paul Grimaud, I know the French basketball team recently beat our US basketball team, but uh, so yeah, they're not at the top of our list right now, but we can be thankful for the French surgeons and their innovation. But Dr. Grimaud developed something called the reverse shoulder replacement. This was back in 1985, and it took it about 20 years until 2004 for the FDA to approve this in the United States. And that's when the first reverse shoulder replacements were implanted. And these reverse replacements were for patients with exactly that problem, who had arthritis and rotator cuff tears as well. Uh, over the course of the years, there's been some expanding indications over about the past 17 years for the reverse shoulder replacement, including patients who have standard arthritis but very bad deformity, for patients who have massive rotator cuff tears that we just can't fix with the camera, for some patients with fractures or a patient who had a failed replacement or lots of bone loss, the reverse replacement can be helpful for those as well. And, and to conceptualize this just a little bit, how this reverse replacement works is we don't have a rotator cuff, so we don't have power from the rotator cuff musculature, but we still have that deltoid muscle, the one we talked about in the beginning, which is that big muscle on the outside of the shoulder, and that muscle rarely ever tears. And so that muscle is presumed to be intact in most patients. And so for instance, a patient like we see here, that doesn't have a rotator cuff, their deltoid is not gonna be able to work very well because the ball is gonna rise up and it's not gonna be centered. In the reverse replacement, what we do is move the center of rotation of the shoulder down and medial. And what this does is put some tension on that deltoid muscle. It stretches it a bit and it allows the deltoid to serve as a primary elevator of the shoulder. So essentially we're changing the center of rotation, the biomechanics of the shoulder to allow another muscle to substitute for the rotator cuff. And that's how the reverse replacement works. If we look at this conceptually, looking at an anatomic replacement uh, on the left, we see the ball replaced just like the normal ball would be and the plastic socket here. The reverse replacement looks different. It's called a reverse because the ball is put where the socket normally would be. And so on the reverse diagram here, if I can get my, my cursor here, here is the ball of the reverse, which is on the glenoid side or the socket side. It's held in place by screws. And here is the socket on the ball side. So it's flipped around, which allows us to change the center of rotation and provides stability to this type of replacement. This prosthesis, the reverse prosthesis, can lead to significant improvements in pain and function for the patients. And what we found over the years is that the pain relief is fairly similar to that of an anatomic or a normal shoulder replacement. But the range of motion and strength are not always as good as the anatomic. Remember, the anatomic has a rotator cuff and this one doesn't. And so this initially was really a salvage procedure where there was nothing else to do. Now, over 17 years, this has become very routine and we have found better and better results as we've done more and more of these. And what the reverse is good at is taking a patient like you see on the right, 
whose left shoulder really can't get up at, at all. He can't lift it any further than that. That's considered a pseudo paralytic shoulder. Now the reverse replacement's not gonna make him a Rafael Nadal and, and hitting tennis strokes like this, but generally it gets patients to be able to elevate their arm up to here. And this is a significant improvement compared to this other patient's preoperative status. And so what, what about the results? Just a slide, people ask, well, how long are these gonna last? You know, how long are the shoulders good for? If you put new tires on your car, do you get 50,000 miles or 60,000 miles or what? Depends on how you drive. And there are a number of long-term studies looking at shoulder replacement. When we group some of these together, there's somewhere between a 93 and 97% survival. If we look at patients over about a 10 year time frame, 87% at 15 years and 84% at 20 years. So the survival rate of these replacements is good, even in the long term. Uh, these studies have shown reliable improvements in pain and function. And if you, if you survey these patients who've had shoulder replacements, the relief from moderate to severe pain is seen in 83 to 88%. And nine out of 10 patients or so report that they're better or much better. Um, the shoulder replacement, the total shoulder replacement does result in more predictable results than those with a partial shoulder replacement because you're resurfacing and replacing both sides of the joint and not just one. And so to talk a little bit about the background of, of shoulder replacements, most everyone's heard of knee replacements and hip replacements, which are more common. And some people come to the office and say, hey, do you actually replace shoulders? I've never heard of that. And the reason is, is the, the hip and the knees came first because these were weight bearing joints and much of the research was dedicated to those. The shoulder came a little bit later, but the incidence of shoulder replacements that we're putting in is increasing rapidly. This is due to increased prevalence of, of shoulder arthritis and a more active geriatric population. Many of us wanna be active into our older years if you look at some numbers, uh, these have really increased exponentially going from 2000 to 2013 to 2017. And this trend has continued up even into 2021. And where we see the biggest growth in shoulder replacement is in those patients between the age of about 65 and 85 years old. We certainly have some outliers who are younger, who develop early arthritis and some older patients who are very healthy and active uh, over 85 who qualify for replacements as well. To talk a little bit about the procedure, if one were to have a, a shoulder replacement, what happens before surgery is we get medical clearance and all the preoperative studies to make sure that medical issues are under control and this is a safe procedure to perform. Uh, typically we'll meet with a pre-op or SATU nursing team at, at Advent Health Hospital that goes through your past medical history and medication and checks these studies and talks a little bit about the procedure. And then there's a separate history and physical appointment with your surgeon to go over the actual procedure itself and to talk about what to expect in, in the coming days after the surgery. Uh, the day of surgery, you come in, you meet the anesthesia team who's gonna be taking care of you. And for almost all of our replacements, we have the anesthesia team perform what's called an interscaling block or a regional anesthesia. What this does is it numbs the entire arm and assists with pain control, uh, both during the surgery, so you require less of the, of the general anesthesia, but also after the surgery for somewhere between it usually 15 and 24 hours, it helps that, that first day to get by without having a nearly as much pain. Uh, they use general anesthesia as well to put you to sleep, so it's not something that you're awake for so that we can perform the procedure. And then over the last several years, there's been much research dedicated to developing a multimodal pain approach. And that, that means you, know, you don't just come out of surgery and get lots of, of morphine to control your pain, that you're given different medications beforehand. These are Tylenol, anti-spasm medications, nerve medications, and the nerve block. And this multimodal pain approach has shown much higher satisfaction and much less pain after surgery. Initially, this was always said to be a very painful surgery, but over the past several years, we've developed protocols which have made it much less painful. Uh, I wanted to show a picture of positioning, what happens when you come into the operating room to get a shoulder replacement. And this is performed in what's called a beach chair position. And so this is how you would be. This is a patient who's sitting up uh, almost in a semi-reclined position or a beach chair position. And we use what's called a pneumatic arm holder to hold the arm, which gives us a, a essentially an extra set of hands to position that in space to allow us to position the shoulder to appropriately place the implants. Uh, when we go to replace a shoulder, we make an incision on the front of the shoulder and that allows us to come down between two major muscle groups. So between what's called the deltoid 
and the pectoralis major, which is the chest muscle here, there is a plane between these two muscles which we can open up without having to cut a muscle to get down deeper safely to the shoulder. Once we're deeper, we encounter the same group of rotator cuff muscles that we talked about before. If there is a reverse replacement and the rotator cuff is torn, we may not have to deal with this, but in a standard replacement, we have to remove the subscapularis tendon. So there are different ways that we can take the subscapularis tendon down. And we basically open that tendon up so we can access the joint and perform the replacement. And at the end of the surgery, we repair that tendon back to right where we, we took it off. And if we run through the steps, once we've opened up that subscapularis muscle, the first step is typically to make a cut on the humerus and remove the damaged ball. Uh, after that, we perform some reaming of the humerus and prepare it to accept the implant. And then we turn our attention to the, the glenoid or the socket. We clear off the arthritis from the glenoid. We drill it to prepare it for the socket. And then we proceed with putting in the implant. We put in a stem, which keeps the, the ball from rotating. This is fit down into the bone, typically without the use of cement. And then we put a ball on top of that stem. We place the glenoid component, which is the plastic for the socket, and typically small amounts of cement are used to hold this in position. And once we're completed, we have a new ball, which is made of a metal alloy, and the new socket, which is made of a highly researched plastic called polyethylene. And that's the complete shoulder replacement. Uh, during surgery, there have been some significant advancements over the last five or six years, which have significantly helped us in terms of accuracy and being able to capture uh, or tackle more difficult cases. Uh, one of these is the use of preoperative planning and what we call intraoperative computer navigation. And in many shoulder replacements where there's not a lot of deformity, say the ball and socket have worn normally and not eccentrically, not to more of one side or the other, then it's fairly straightforward to place the implants for a shoulder replacement. Uh, some patients, as you can see in this CT scan here, have worn down one side of the socket more than the other. It's typically the back of the socket, and we call this eccentric posterior wear. It's almost as if you had a golf tee and you just you know, rubbed off one side of the golf tee. Well, the golf ball is gonna wanna slip down that golf golf tee and go to the back. And so when putting in a shoulder replacement, if, you're, if your golf tee is sideways or angulated, you don't want to put the socket in angulated as well because that shoulder replacement is not going to work as well. And so some of the implant companies over time have developed special types of, of sockets, which are called augmented sockets. And these sockets, rather than being flat and putting them flat onto the surface of the, of the glenoid, they have an angulation on the back or an augment, which allows us to correct that angulation using specialized tools. We are able to actually plan for the shoulder replacement using a computer before the surgery and try out different implants, which we used to have to try out during the surgery. We can do that now on a computer beforehand and actually pick the implants we want beforehand. Now, we still confirm that at the time of surgery, but have a much better idea of how it's gonna be coming in. And this has made surgery much more accurate. Uh, this is a picture of us trialing out a system in the lab uh, where we have a CT scan, we plan for it, and then during surgery, while performing the replacement, we can see in real time where we're drilling and what we're doing and look at the angulation of the shoulder. So we have a correlation between the preoperative CT scan and what we're doing at the time of surgery, and this allows us to perform navigation of very difficult bony deformities and has made these type of technically challenging surgeries much easier in the modern era. And so here's an example again. This is a patient with glenohumeral osteoarthritis, bone on bone articulation. And we're able to take this patient and perform a total shoulder replacement. You can see the ball of the shoulder here, which replaces the ball, which was worn out. The stem coming down the humerus, which is holding the ball in place and keeping it from rotating. And then there's a little marker you see inside of the bone here, which is a marker for the socket. The socket is made of that plastic, so you don't see it, but you see now there's space between the ball and socket as compared to this preoperative imaging. Uh, over time, some more uh, novel and innovative implants have come about, including implants such as this, which is called a stemless replacement. And so this replacement puts a ball on top with a very short stem, and the stem doesn't have to go all the way down the, the humerus. The certain patients qualify for this, and this saves bone and saves some steps with the procedure. And these are types of implants which have been developed and are now 
available for use, which we have available here in Asheville and also across the world. And so with a reverse replacement, here's a patient who comes in who's developing some arthritis in the setting of a large rotator cuff tear, which couldn't be repaired. And so they were a candidate for a reverse replacement. So we take this patient from this x-ray on the left to this x-ray on your right, showing the placement of that reverse uh, shoulder replacement. Again, we've placed the ball on the socket side. You can see a post and multiple screws which are holding that into the glenoid in the socket. And then we've put the socket here on the normal ball side with a stem holding it. And there is a plastic or polyethylene insert between these two, which allows them to run smoothly and provides stability to the shoulder replacement. After surgery, we do several things. One, we place what's called a shoulder immobilizer. This is a sling, as you see on the right, which also has a pillow, which keeps the arm nice and still and supports it. We're fairly aggressive about icing the shoulder to reduce inflammation or reduce pain, both in the hospital and when going home. And we are a huge proponent of early mobilization. Get out of bed, move and walk as soon as post-operative day number one and post-operative day number zero or the day of surgery. We get up and move around. This helps people be able to go home. This helps limit blood clots and other issues you can have by staying in bed. Uh, I put this slide in, you're probably wondering why there's an x-ray of an ankle in the shoulder arthritis talk and maybe thought I got confused or one of my foot and ankle partners uh, hijacked my presentation. But, but I put this x-ray in because this is my ankle. This is my left ankle. And I learned a little bit about post-operative pain control by being a patient myself. I, I fell and had an accident out in Colorado about five years ago and had surgery to repair a broken ankle. And I had a nerve block the same way that my shoulder patients get nerve blocks for their replacement. And what I learned with the nerve block is it provided great pain control until it didn't. And when it wore off, the pain came on very, very quickly. And I got this rebound pain and it was quite difficult to get through. And, and that personal experience taught me that we have to stay on top of the pain management after shoulder surgery. And so what we do is, is pay attention to the patients and as soon as the hand is starting to wake up or the arm is tingling, when the nerve block is just starting to wear off, that's when we recommend giving pain medications and that significantly helps prevent that rebound pain. And so we've learned a lot of lessons over time and some of them uh, through personal experience as well. In the post-operative period, most patients spend one night in the hospital, about 90% spend one night in the hospital after replacements. And certain patients who are healthy may qualify to even go home that same day. Uh, we do wear the sling essentially day and night. We require sleeping in this after the surgery to protect our replacement and our repair. And we allow patients to come out for what's called pendulum exercises, just hanging down and swinging the arm and for showering only initially after surgery. Uh, one issue after shoulder replacement or any shoulder surgery is that of sleeping. And we recommend patients sleep in a recliner or sleep in a semi-elevated position which helps uh, significantly with pain, helps keep people from rolling on it, and is a much more comfortable position. And then wear loose, fit, loose fitting button down clothing, which is easy to get in and out of. We have very detailed uh, post-operative instructions. This just shows uh, what patients are given after a shoulder replacement, going through each of the activities, dressing changes, uh, things to call about, icing, et cetera. And then we have a specific protocols which have been developed for shoulder replacements, uh, both for anatomic and reverse. Typically the first two weeks are resting, doing pendulum exercises. Formal therapy commences about week two. Now this is for passive range of motion where the physical therapist takes your arm and they move it for you. And the replacement can tolerate that well and keeps you from getting stiff and starts to restore motion. But we don't start what's called active motion where you actually lift the arm under your own accord until about week six. And this is so that we protect that rotator cuff that we had to violate to get in there and make sure that everything is, is prepared uh, for you to be able to move it. At week six, we let you come out of the sling. You start doing more of the activities of daily living with that arm. That's eating and drinking and brushing your teeth and eventually getting back to your hair, but not a lot of heavy lifting. And then around week 10 after the surgery, we start strengthening and a gradual return back to activity. Uh, we do wear the sling, as we mentioned, for six weeks, and this is predominantly to allow that rotator cuff to heal. Once the implants are, are placed in, they are very strong day one, and if you've had a hip replacement, you say, well, I, I got up after my hip replacement. I was walking on it the very first day, and that's a little bit different because the hip is not as reliant on muscles. You don't have to go through muscles 
that power of the hips. So you don't have to let those heal. For the shoulder, we do have to let the muscles, which we go through, specifically that subscapularis muscle, it has to heal before you use it. And if you try to use it too quickly, that muscle can re-tear, which causes a major problem for us. This is a, a zoomed out example for which the details are, are not important of our, our physical therapy protocol. And we've developed these over time for the therapist where we have every week detailed out for the exercises which are allowed to be done, the range of motion which is allowed. And this is kind of a week by week stepwise progression that makes it easy for the therapist to follow, helps us to protect our replacements and helps us to get, helps us to get optimal outcomes for our patients. And then what about expectations? So after surgery, what can you do? After a shoulder replacement, you're usually typing with the arm, you can write with it, and you're doing some physical therapy for the first six weeks after surgery. And that's kind of about it. Uh, after six weeks, you drive, you use it for the activities of daily living, the eating and drinking and washing, and then very light use without heavy lifting. That's week six to 12 until about the three month mark. And then after three months, we start that strengthening around 10 weeks, but we really progress it at three months. So this is progressive lifting and gradual return to activities, whether it's, it's golf or tennis, over the course of that three to six month time frame. And, and I tell all of my patients, it takes about a year to see maximum improvement. Uh, if you're somewhere at six months and say your motion is not quite where you wanna be, you can definitely improve that up to a year. At a year, we find most patients are about where they're gonna be after replacement surgery, but that's the level of maximum improvement. If I can see somebody at six months and they tell me they're not really thinking about their shoulder, they've kind of forgotten that they had surgery, then I, I think we've done a good job. And if we see somebody at a year, hopefully they're back to all their activities and uh, not really thinking about the shoulder very much. And then finally, just, just to make mention, I think one thing which has changed significantly in medicine and surgery over the last 25 or 30 years is the fact that the technology which has proliferated because of the internet and because of research is not just available at certain institutions. Maybe you know, 45 years ago, if you wanted a shoulder replacement, you had to be at one of five major institutions. But the same technology which I used at my residency at Mass General, which is a huge academic center, and that my friends who are still there now are using, we have the exact same technology uh, even here in Hendersonville and in Asheville, the same implants, the same computer navigation, that everything is available to patients of Western North Carolina to have these procedures right here at home and not have to travel up to the Cleveland Clinic or to MGH or Brigham or other places. And I think that's, uh, that's what's made it really fun for some of us who've got to train at, at great places and see all of this technology that we can live in places where we really wanna live, like Western North Carolina, and take care of people here with the same exact technology that they have at other major institutions around the world. 